Now we're going to talk about resistivity and its relationship with resistance. Different materials resist uh, the flow of electricity more or less than others, and some don't resist it at all. So definition of resistivity. The resistivity is denoted by the Greek symbol rho, R-H-O, and uh, it appears here in this definition. The resistance that we already know about, measured in ohms, appears here. And if you have a conductor that you want to find the, resist the resistance of, R, then what's important in, in determining that resistance is the amount of material you have. So you might be attaching this wire to the positive side of a terminal, the positive terminal of a battery, and this side to a, side to a negative terminal of a battery. This is uh, metal, metal conductor, same thing over on the other side. And then the material here is the material that we're interested in. And you're going to put some kind of material in there that will resist electricity more or less. Usually metals like copper or aluminum don't resist it hardly at all. Um, but we'll put some material in there that will resist uh, the electricity. So what matters here is the length of that material and the cross-sectional area of that material perpendicular to the direction of flow of current. Now if this is uh, the positive terminal of the battery over here, connected to the positive terminal, then what direction will the current be in? You say, well, I know that. Um, I put, just put a positive charge here and ask which direction it's, gonna, it's going to go. And, and that will be this direction. It will be repelled by this positive charge and attracted to the negative charge on the other side. So that would be the direction of current. And that length L of material is in the direction of the current. And then A is the cross-sectional area of the material that is perpendicular to the direction of the current. And then the resistivity will be measured in units of ohm meters. How do we know that? Well, if the resistivity is measured in ohm meters here, if you have a length measured in meters and an area measured in meters squared, then you have an ohm meter times another meter divided by meters squared. Well, the meters up here cancel the meters down here, and you get an answer that's measured in ohms. So that's how the units work out for the resistivity. Here are some resistivities of various materials. Uh, aluminum uh, and copper have very low resistivities. Of those on this uh, chart, it looks like copper is the winner. Uh, ha having the lowest resistivity. Then gold, then aluminum, then some of these other tungsten, silver, etc. Um, we also have, and these are conductors, so they have very low resistivities. Semiconductors, car carbon, germanium, and silicon have much larger resistivities. So, um, Instead of an exponent of 10 to the minus 8, we're talking about 10 to the minus 5, or 10 to the 1, for that matter. And then insulators have resistivities with positive exponents. So, tough to get any current through those, those insulators. And we talked about that before, the difference between a conductor and an insulator. And this, uh, in the last chapter, and this puts some flesh on the bones there. Here um, are some demonstrations of assorted resistors. These are some resistors of various sizes. A resistor is, is a, a wire that comes in, a wire that comes out, and then material that's intended to impede the flow of electricity in the middle. And um, 
because the conductor is not very good in a resistor, that's the whole idea, you want it to create some resistance, then there can be a potential difference, a voltage difference from the one side to the other. Resistors that you'll find in your computer, or in your electronics, your washing machine, et cetera, et cetera, um, are color coded. Um, and you can look up these codes online to figure out how many ohms the resistor is, what its resistance is based on its color coding. Uh, bigger resistors with, um, uh, that'll handle a lot more current um, here, where the smaller resistors that'll handle less current here. So those are some resistors. Okay, this is a demonstration of the Meissner effect of superconductivity. As I hinted at the beginning of this section, some conductors offer no resistance to the flow of electricity. You can, for superconductors, you can put a current in a loop of wire and it will stay in that loop for years with no degradation in the current. And this is a de demonstration of something called the Meissner effect of superconductivity. This is a demonstration of a superconductor. 20 years or so ago, conductor, superconductors were discovered that were high enough, at high enough temperatures that you could demonstrate superconductivity at temperatures associated with liquid nitrogen. So what I have here is an yttrium barium copper oxide superconductor, this cylinder here, that's it. And I'm, it, is, it is not a superconductor at room temperature. And I can demonstrate that by placing this magnet on top of it and it just rests on top of it. What we're going to do is to cool it down to below its critical temperature for superconductivity using this liquid nitrogen. When that happens, the superconductors expel all magnetic fields from their interiors by generating currents around the outside of the superconductors. And so what happens when you put a magnet, such as this cube-shaped magnet, on top of it, is that the magnetic field of this magnet is expelled by the superconductor, and the magnet rests on, essentially, on a bed of magnetic fields. And it will levitate on top of the superconductor. Okay, we're, we're allowing this guy to, uh, to cool down. I think I'm going to pour off a little bit of this liquid nitrogen so that we can see the top surface of the, uh, the superconductor. That'll do real good to the equipment here. So let's see how close we are to superconductivity uh, temperatures. Okay, so now what I think you can see is that this, uh, this magnet is balanced, levitated in the vicinity of the superconductor. And the magnetic field produced by the magnet is trying to penetrate the superconductor and the superconductor is expelling those fields, causing um, an upward force on the magnet. That's superconductors. These uh, superconductors um, can, at, when, when they're at below their critical temperature for superconductivity, can carry a current for years without any degradation to the current, zero resistance. So they're very, very fascinating objects and very important to lots of applications. Let's see if I can, this one's just fun to play with. I think it's obvious now that the magnetic field direction is, is in this direction of the magnet. Okay, an example. Instructions for Electric lawnmower suggests that a 20 gauge extension cord
can be used for distances up to 35 meters, so 20 gauge. But a thicker 16 gauge cord can be used for longer distances. And you're saying, well, hang on just a second. Uh, 16 gauge is thicker? The answer is yes. The gauges, as the gauge numbers go up from 16 to 20, the wire gets thinner and thinner. Sorry about that. It's not my fault. That's the convention. So the cross-sectional area of a 20 gauge wire is 5.2 times 10 to the minus 7 square meters, whereas 16 gauge is 13 times 10 to the minus 7 square meters. That's the cross-sectional area. So this number clearly for the 16 gauge is larger than the cross-sectional area for the 20 gauge. Perfect. Determine the resistance of a 35, a 35 meter length of 20 gauge copper wire and a 75 meter length of 16 gauge copper wire. Well, it's easy. Uh, we just use this uh, equation that we've written down for you. Uh, the resistance measured in ohms is the resistivity. And in this case, we're just going to use the number from that table, 1.72 times 10 to the minus 8 ohm meters. Divide by the cross-sectional area, in this case, uh, 5.2 times 10 to the minus 7 is for the 20 gauge. And then this for the 16 gauge. Um, so plugging the numbers in for a 35 meter length, you get 1.2 ohms for 35 meters. Uh, if you do the calculation for actually 75 meters of this thicker wire, you get a resistance uh, that's even actually less than, than the resistance for 35 meters of the 20 gauge wire. So that's how you do these kinds of calculations. They're not difficult. Um, an application, biomedical application, um, and I'm not even sure how to pronounce this, plethysmography. Um, it's a way of diagnosing deep uh, uh, blood clots, the thrombosis in a leg by using electrical, a measurement of electrical res resistivity or resistance. So we've got, um, we're going to measure the voltage between these two um, essentially uh, metal strips that are, that, are, that are wrapped around the leg. There is a source of current between uh, these red strips. It's provided by a, a source of, uh, of electricity, an AC source in this case, and then a pressure cuff to measure the... So you, you can use this knowing the voltage across the two you can work out the, um, um, determine whether or not there's blood clotting in the, in the leg.